Greetings budding oscilloscope experts and welcome to this video in which we will explore several aspects of the mighty oscilloscope. First off will be how does it react to DC? Uh, what does DC look like on the screen and uh, how can we measure it? And what better test subject than a 9 volt DC battery? connected here to the DC voltmeter and showing an output of exactly 9.7 volts DC. Now that we know the voltage uh, from the battery, I have attached the probe from channel 1 to the positive terminal and the ground clip to the negative terminal. I've uh, set the oscilloscope at ground 5 volts per division channel 1 and turned it on. Uh, then when I get the horizontal scan I've adjusted it with the position knob so that it exactly coincides with the horizontal x-axis. Next we reach in here and switch the bottom switch to DC which is what we're seeing from the battery and you see that it jumps up almost two complete squares. If each square is worth 5 volts that means it's almost 2 times 5 is 10 volts, which is exactly where you'd expect 9.7 volts to uh, show up, just below the 10 volt threshold. As you can see, DC tracings uh, are not all that exciting. They're just a horizontal line. The vertical deflection from the x-axis uh, shows the voltage of DC. It can be above if it's positive or below if it's negative. Now let's hook up the probe for channel 2 over here to our audio uh, signal generator. We connect the probe itself to the red output and the um, ground clip goes to the negative shield. Uh, I've set it to 10 times 100 which is 1000 cycles per second and I've turned on the signal generator. Now to see the sine wave from the audio frequency generator we we'll come over here go to channel 2 and we see it uh, on the scope we can use the amplitude adjustment here to set it to about the right height which I'm going to say is a total of four squares high and we can uh, arrange its position vertically so that the midline of the sine wave, the zero point, is right along the x-axis. My uh, channel 2 volts uh, per division are 0 0.5. I'm in alt uh, mode and down below here I am uh, in AC mode and the seconds per division setting is one millisecond per square. That way I have one complete waveform per square on the x-axis which since there are 1000 uh, milliseconds in a second means there will be 1000 waveforms in a full second so this coincides to the 1000 cycle per second uh, output from my audio frequency generator. Okay, so now I've got the AC uh, sine wave on channel 2. I've got the DC uh, signal trace here on channel 1. So let's show them both. Now when I switch to both, you can see it. You can see the DC um, tracing here. You can see the AC tracing, but they're strobing at you. Okay, here is why it's doing it and how you can stop that. When you're asking the scope to draw two different tracings at the same time, it's the same as if I asked you to draw two different uh, pictures on a piece of paper with one pencil at the same time. It's very difficult. The scope is fast though, and it can jump around and uh, actually present two separate uh, scope tracings at one time if they are of high frequency. And if they are of high frequency, the alt setting will freeze them. 1000 cycles per second is very low frequency, and the DC has no frequency.
So to stabilize this uh, scope image, we go to CHOP. CHOP is for low frequency simultaneous display of two different waveforms. In fact, a good rule of thumb is if your seconds per division control is at one millisecond or greater, you will use CHOP and if it's at 0.5 or shorter, then you'll use ALT. Now we're in a position to actually witness something that a lot of people do not realize or doubt that can occur and that is that AC and DC can coexist in the same wire or the same circuit at the same time. They don't interfere with each other, they don't mix and get all muddled up, instead they coexist sort of like oil and water. Now at this moment they're not mixed one probe is showing us the DC, the other probe is showing us the AC. Okay, but if we did mix them, what would happen is this. The AC would act like oil and float on top of the DC water. In other words, when they're combined, the AC is going to be elevated by an amount that exactly represents the amount of DC voltage that is being simultaneously uh, presented with it. Now if you want to see this, to convince yourself it's true, reach over here and flip this to add. Now we put the two together, they're mixed, and look what happened. The AC tracing jumped up so that the center line of the AC tracing was elevated by the amount of DC that was uh, added to it. Okay, let's see it one more time. We're going to uh, go from CHOP over here to ADD and we watch as the AC waveform is buoyed up by the DC which is beneath it. Now this is very important when you're tracing signals in amp circuits because you know very well that AC and DC coexist in amplifier circuits. Uh, when you're going down the line of amplification, if DC is present, uh, can you imagine a plate voltage of 350 volts or so? If, uh, what, 9.7 volts lifted uh, the uh, waveform that high, can you imagine what 400 DC volts are going to, it's going to lift it up to the ceiling, okay? So you might be going along tracing your signal through the amp and the signal disappears. Now you could think, oh, well, now I found the, the breach in the signal chain, so uh, this must be what's wrong. No, all that's happened is, is the DC has elevated your AC signal out of the range of your scope screen. So this phenomenon is something you have to be aware of. Now there's only uh, one more setting that we need to discuss before we're ready to start analyzing amplifier circuits. And that's this one right here, the X1 and X10. Now that should be familiar to you because we've seen the X1 and X10 setting on our probes. This is for the voltage deflection though, which is the vertical displacement. This X1, X10 is for the horizontal deflection. Now what happens when I shift from X1 to X10 is this. Instead of 10 waveforms on the screen, I now see just one. So it's very helpful if you want to magnify one waveform or if you want to enhance uh, the uh, total width of the X axis. But you better remember that you did this because otherwise you're going to look at this and say, let's see, I've got one waveform per screen width and I've got one millisecond per square therefore this is a hundred cycles per second no it's not because you uh, shifted over here to times 10 it's giving you a the idea that it is but it's not go back to times 1 you see there's 10 and you know that one cycle per square is at one millisecond per square is going to be a thousand cycles per second. So don't be fooled. 
Okay, if you ha do go up to times 10, be sure you remember to correct your frequency calculations. Jack, are you hiding somewhere here in the bathroom? Are you? I, I can't see you. No, I guess not. There's a lump over here on the towel. Oh, well, there he is. It's not easy for a black cat to hide on a white sink, but the master of concealment finds ways to do the impossible. Well, the time has come we've all been waiting for. We're going to trace the uh, flow of the signal through the circuit using our oscilloscope. First, let's briefly discuss the preparation. Number one, you might consider buying something for your workbench, and that is a dummy load. This is a big heat dissipating 8 ohm resistor that I'm going to use instead of connecting the circuit to a speaker. Now the reason for that is if you've ever listened to a 1000 or 2500 cycle tone at fairly high volume for any length of time, uh, you'll understand why this is a real good idea. Okay, you won't have any noise. Uh, the, uh, the amp will be dead silent, yet this resistor will be absorbing all of the output power. These are generally available on eBay at reasonable prices. This is a single 8 ohm. You could get two 8 ohms, and then you could cover all the bases. Series for 16, parallel for 4, single for 8. Next step, I'm going to plug the amplifier circuit into a current limiter and then plug the current limiter into my isolation transformer using a 3 to 2 adapter so that the current limiter and the amp circuit will not be grounded. Okay, the next step, and this one is optional but it's very helpful. I use a green magic marker to designate the grids of each of the tubes that I'm going to be uh, monitoring with the oscilloscope. Uh, this saves time and it's also a little safety feature uh, so that you uh, know exactly what points in the chassis you're connecting your probes to. Now why, you may ask, do we use the grids for our probe attachment rather than the plates? Well, if you remember in the first portion of this video, we discussed how uh, high DC can elevate the AC signal, perhaps even out of the scope range. So we're going to use the coupling capacitor to block the high DC so that we'll have AC only on our grid uh, to visualize on our oscilloscope. Also, if we did see any DC elevation of the AC signal after the coupling cap, that's a great indication that the coupling cap is leaky and it's time to replace it. Next step, either make or buy a cable which will connect to your uh, signal generator uh, using a shielded cable and input a signal with a quarter inch jack so you can plug it in to the input jacks on the amp. Next we'll install a probe in channel 1 of our oscilloscope, bring it over here and connect it to one of the two grids of the 6SC7. Uh, the probe is set to X1. The ground clip, I'm going to use the same ground that the input jack used. Next I'm going to set my signal generator to 10 times 100 or 1000 cycles per second and turn it on. Now you can set yours to 2500, 3000, wherever you want to set it. Uh, the end result is going to be about the same, but uh, this is strictly an arbitrary number that I've picked. Okay, now we switch uh, our channel 1 to AC and we get a readout here which we can adjust the vertical deflection using our volts per division knob. I'm going to keep this fairly short for reasons that you will see. I'm at one volt per square, so that's a plus one, minus one uh, AC sine wave that I'm sending into the amplifier. You can adjust your amplitude down here so that it is exactly plus and minus one square. You can use your vertical position to center it along the x-axis. 
Now we set uh, channel 2 to exactly the same settings as channel 1. AC, 1 volt per division. Okay, then we connect the probe. It's set to X1 to the grid of the next tube in the um, amplification chain, which is going to be pin 5 of the 6J5 right here. I've connected the ground clip to exactly the same wire as the first ground clip, so I have no potential between my ground clips. Now take a look at your scope tracing. You'll see it looks exactly like the input. Now reach over and turn up the volume all the way so you're not attenuating the strength of the output signal. Now compare that to the input signal. Do you see a tremendous increase in amplitude? That is the gain of your first amplification stage. Now if you'd like a direct comparison between the amplitude of the input signal and the amplitude of the signal after one stage of amplification, just go to both and you can superimpose them. The puny little input signal, the gigantic signal that's being put out by the first triode of the 6SC7. You see what gain is all about? Look at the uh, tremendous increase in amplitude. Now, uh, besides letting us see this, which is a wonderful benefit of the oscilloscope, we can also go in and actually measure how much gain took place. Uh, so let's do that. Remember that our initial gain right here is about 1 volt per square, so we're plus or minus 1 volt. That was the input signal. Okay, let's switch just to channel 2 and adjust the amplitude of our one stage of amplification signal down to where we can actually see the top and bottom of the sine wave. Also notice that clipping is taking place here, which is typical when you turn any amp up to full volume, you're going to see some clipping. Okay, but let's measure the voltage that's uh, present in the amplitude of this uh, amplified six. To do that we'll adjust the position to where the wave is centered and we look at our volts uh, per division setting which is 5 volts per division so I'm gonna say that it is about 8 volts would you say 5 plus 3 is about plus or minus 8 volts so after one stage of amplification, our signal is eight times greater than the input signal. Okay, uh, that's the result of one stage of amplification. An increase from plus or minus one volt to an increase of plus or minus eight volts. Now I turn off the amp and with one hand I set the channel two probe on the grid of the uh, 6V6 six six tube. So we'll see now what is the strength of the signal after one, two stages of amplification. Okay, I turn on the amp and I look at the incredible increase that has happened after two stages of amplification. Remember we set this to 5 volts per division and shrank it down to where it was about 1.8 squares. Now look at it. Do you see a more gain has taken place as a result of the 6J52? Well exactly how much gain uh, do we have now after two stages of amplification, you ask, and I say well let's find out. Now we're pretty well maxed out on the times one probe. So step one here to find out uh, the actual uh, two stage gain is we're going to switch our probe to times 10. And you see what's happened here. Uh, it's clipping now top and bottom because it's a stronger signal and it's more prone to clip. Let's adjust the uh, curve so that it is exactly centered on the x-axis and it looks to me like it's 5 times 10, remember it's times 10 on my probe, 50 volts plus and minus. So after two stages of amplification my signal is now 50 times stronger than 
the input signal. Here's something else that the scope can do for you. Uh, do you want to see when the onset of uh, distortion uh, occurs here in this amp? I'm going to crank the volume down to about half volume, a little over half, and you see how my curve has a nice uh, a peak and trough that's a smooth curvature. And then run the volume back up until it starts to square off and look at the volume setting that creates that. That is where the preamp distortion is going to begin in your amplifier at that volume setting. When you crank it all the way up, it doesn't get all that much louder, does it? But it sure distorts. So for about one-third of the volume rotation, I'm not getting that much more volume, but I am getting some pretty significant distortion. So it appears that our input signal of plus or minus 1 volt was stepped up to plus or minus 8 volts by the 6SC7 and then uh, by the 6J5 stepped way up to 50 volts plus or minus being applied to the grid of the 6V6. Now let's use our oscilloscope to measure the RMS output power of our mighty true sound amp. First remove all the probes from inside the chassis. The amp is turned off. Uh, we come over here now and connect channel 1's probe set to X10 uh, to, uh, with the probe connected to the positive uh, speaker wire and the ground clip connected to the ground speaker wire. If you have any trouble figuring out which is which just see which wire has continuity with the chassis. That's your ground speaker wire. Okay, we have the volume set to zero. The times 10 probe uh, correctly aligned here on our uh, ballast resistor, 8 ohm, representing the speaker. We turn the amp on, let it warm up. We see the position on the screen of the uh, zero volume line and now we're going to reach over and start to crank in a little more volume and watch what happens here we're going to get stronger and stronger signal until distortion starts to kick in see how the peaks are starting to sharpen uh, the side is caving in on it we're getting pretty good distortion above half volume. I'm going to back off to a little over half volume. Okay, that looks pretty good to me. The peaks look nice and symmetrical. Let's position it up to where it is centered about the x-axis. And now we're going to need to uh, measure and determine the amount of voltage represented by the amplitude of this undistorted sine wave. Okay, I'm set to 0.2 volts per division, but because my probe is times 10, that's 2 volts per division. So it's going to be uh, plus 2, 4, plus and minus 6 volts uh, will be the excursion here of our, the AC waveform. Now, if you're wondering how the plus or minus 50 volt input signal to the 6V6 comes out to the speaker as a measly plus or minus 6 volts? Well, remember what output transformers do. The output from the 6V6, which was very high voltage, and very low current, went into the output transformer and came out just the opposite. Very low voltage, in this case plus or minus 6 volts, but very high current so that it could drive the speaker. Okay, let's use the measurements we just obtained to calculate the RMS output power of our a little true sound amp. The load resistance is 8 ohms. That is not an inductive load. Uh, it is rated with a DC resistance of 8 ohms. Peak voltage, 6 volts DC we got from our scope amplitude. RMS output formula is peak voltage squared divided by load resistance times 0 0.707. Why do we do this? Because I told you the scope gives us peak voltage ratings. 
you're used to having your multimeter convert uh, your voltages to RMS. The oscilloscope does not do that for you. You have to do it yourself. So this is a correction to correct the peak voltage to RMS voltage. We end up with 6 squared divided by 8 times 0 0.707 which is 3.2 watts RMS output power. Now before you start groaning and moaning too much remember this is what a 65 year old amp operating on a used 6V6 and also this is pre-distortion output power. Now if we were willing to crank the volume all the way up wide open we'd get a higher output power but uh, it would be with a great deal of distortion and may not even be usable. So this is the pre-distortion uh, RMS output power of this little amp and that's fair. Well I guess that does it for this two-part video. We had 10 minutes of theory and then about 16 minutes of hands-on practical use of the oscilloscope for testing amp circuits. In the future I'll be posting videos showing other things you can do with the oscilloscope uh, to troubleshoot amps and test them. If you found the little true sound amp that we used as our test subject interesting, uh, it was a gift from a very generous viewer who sent it to me uh, to see if I could fix it up and use it in a video and I did. Uh, in fact it's going to be the star of its own video in the near future uh, in which I show the step-by-step -step restoration of it uh, from the way it arrived to the way you see it now. I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to all the Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors who are keeping this channel on the air and advertising free. I'll include links in the video description for those of you who would like to join uh, the numbers of contributors and help us stay afloat. Meanwhile, thanks so much for watching. I hope you at least will subscribe and stay tuned for future videos because they're on the way. We'll see you then.